When warrior monk Kane Doshi and wandering ronin Daisuke Togakure conceived ninjutsu at the end of the 12th century, their intention was to create a discipline combining subtlety, stealth and precision, so it's unlikely they predicted the nature of the 1980s ninja boom. Ninja! Ninja! Are you sure that you're a ninja? He's no ninja. What's a ninja? Built on cocaine, greed and mustaches, the Ninja Boom was one of the defining fads of the VHS era, spawning around 200 movies from over a dozen countries. And this is their story. Don't blame me when it doesn't make sense. This is the way of the ninja. The first great ninja craze emerged from the fog in the early 1960s but proved a uniquely Japanese affair. Sweeping the country on the heels of intrigue-laden blockbuster Shinobi no Mono, the films were almost exclusively Jedi Geki, or period set, intended to balance spy thriller with soap opera. Unless they didn't. Either way, they established a movie persona for the ninja, which is kind of what repelled briefly onto the world stage in 1967 James Bond movie You Only Live Twice. But despite that breakthrough cameo, their screen appearances remained largely limited to Japanese films and TV, made largely for Japanese audiences. But that would begin to change in 1972. Kenjo Mizumi's Kutsuri Okami, better known as Sword of Vengeance, better known still as Lone Wolf and Cub, but probably best known in the West as Shogun Assassin, or Baby Cart in Hell, is the first in a series of vengeful ronin movies that like to deploy eccentric ninjas in waves of relentless ultraviolence. It stars Tamisaburo Wakayama as former assassin Agami Ito, who along with his infant child wanders Edo-era Japan murdering ninjas with a sword. Those ninjas were a taste of the upcoming boom as much as a part of the previous one, with their exotic weaponry, dubious approach to stealth, and shockingly high-pressure circulatory systems. In the early 70s, that boom was still a decade away though and must have seemed unimaginable, the attention of viable audiences being focused elsewhere at the time. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. What they needed was their own Enter the Dragon, an electrifying blockbuster designed to showcase ninja potential to the West. Just the kind of movie Enforcer from Death Row isn't. Bullsh but it was the first of its kind, the patient zero of the ninja epidemic. The first movie to be inadvertently entertaining in a way we'd recognize. And despite being Filipino, the first to be shot in English and the first to star an American. In Arkansas's own Leo Fong. An actor. Good afternoon. Yes, may I help you, sir? Yes, I would like to see Mr. Cervantes. When do we expect him? Well, I don't know. Where does he usually stay? in a hotel or an apartment. He's staying at the President Hotel. Thank you. It didn't do much for ninjas, but it was a start. Part of a mid-70s advance infiltration that saw them popping up on American TV in shows like Hawaii Five-0. You are a ninja, aren't you? None of these appearances made particular use of ninja-specific attributes, though. And it wasn't until 1980 that we finally saw an English-language, American-made ninja movie that actually exploited and explored its subject. Chuck Norris. Karen Carlson, Lee Van Cleef, the Octagon. If Enforcer from Death Row was Patient Zero, the original carrier identified long after a virus has run wild, then the Octagon was the first deadly outbreak, ravaging US theatergoers to the tune of $29 million and pointing to the potential for a humanitarian disaster. 
Actually, I think I'm going to abandon this analogy. It's not as much. It uses ninjas well. In a lot of these things, they could be switched out for any other martial party, but the Octagon really plays up their classic persona as a quasi-mythic cult of mysterious assassins. If you saw ninjas, you're seeing ghosts. Whether a ninja trend would have developed off the back of the Octagon alone is doubtful based on its first imitation. Thought I might drop in. What? The Shinobi Ninja was rushed into production as a vehicle for Tadashi Yamashita, but as good as he was at the fighting, the acting didn't come so easy. More training's needed! For some reason, all the ninjas have numbers on their heads, and voiceover man thinks he's on National Geographic. Ninjutsu was originated in Japan. It is the result of a combination of intense physical and mental training, and all important, spiritual experiences. Maybe you could leave your undercover work till tomorrow. Right now, I'm horny. The reality is the Octagon was just part of a groundswell of international ninja interest that really started to deliver in 1980. US author Eric Van Lustbader published the novel The Ninja in April, and it was still on the New York Times bestseller list when the Octagon was released in August. More importantly for moviegoers, in November, Lone Wolf and Cub finally found their way to the US in the form of Shogun Assassin, a dubbed re-edit of the first two movies that made a big impression on a generation of genre fans. When I was little, my father was famous. He was the greatest samurai in the empire. He cut off the heads of 131 lords. It was a bad time for the empire. Back home in Japan, ninja series Shadow Warriors was a hit on TV, with Sonny Chiba as the ancestor of Kill Bill's Hattori Hanzo. While in Hong Kong, ninjas had found a toehold playing villains, and it would be just a couple of years before the region began producing perhaps the best movies of the craze. <laughs> Meanwhile, just outside Manila, Two weeks after Chuck Norris debuted The Octagon in the autumn of 1980, fellow former karate champion Mike Stone talked his way into Cannon's Sunset Boulevard headquarters and presented its occupants with a script entitled Dance of Death. Within three months, founder Menachem Golan had bought it, rewritten it, announced Stone in the lead role, fired him after changing his mind, and rehired him as fight choreographer. It's unbelievable! Welcome to the wacky world of Cannon, Mike. That's a hell of an introduction. <laughs> Much of the plot's basically the same as the Octagons, with both movies built around the rivalry between estranged ninja brothers, one of them Japanese and with a chip on his shoulder, the other American and with a mustache. In both movies, they're motivated to avenge the murder of a friend, and in both movies, women constantly try to have sex with them. That's an insult to both of us. It makes me stupid, and you a whore. Tadashi Yamashita was offered the role of villainous ninja Hasegawa, but after the Octagon, he only wanted to play the hero and turned it down in favor of the Shinobi Ninja. So it was up to resident expert Stone to find an alternative. You want Ninja. I find Ninja. Fortunately, he'd brought Shokasugi over from California to play a variety of extras, and after impressing with a ninjutsu demonstration, Golan took a punt on the unknown actor and the rest is history. His screen persona was set. I have come from Japan to revenge. Enter the Ninja proved popular and today is often seen as single-handedly inspiring the ninja craze that followed, but I'm not so sure. Good God Almighty! About half the ninja craze consisted of Hong Kong's infamous cut-and-paste Franken movies, and while Enter the Ninja was key to creating a market for them, the only aspects that actually influenced them were its contemporary setting and white guy with moustache. <laughs> Elsewhere, Hong Kong's proper ninja movies look much like Taiwan's, which is to say kung fu movies with added ninja. The ninja kung fu is the best. Enter the Ninja was still hugely important though, firstly because it inspired Canon to keep making ninja movies. <laughs> Secondly, it launched Shoka Sugi, who came to define the ninja in the Western mind with his explosive intensity. But without Enter the Ninja, there's a chance he'd have remained the guy in the background in the bad news bears go to Japan. <laughs> Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, it reached almost every corner of the world. Chuck Norris enticed young American males into buying more tickets, but that didn't do much for the ninja's mainstream profile. Any of you boys know what a ninja is? Ain't it that new type of Jap camera? <laughs> <laughs>
Franco Nero, meanwhile, spoke to a wider and much more international audience, and it was arguably through him that the ninja became established beyond its martial arts fan base. Kampai. But fortunately for that fan base, both he and his ridiculous love triangle were gone for the sequel. No one can survive the revenge of the ninja. <laughs> revenge of the ninja, a Golan Globus production. Enter the ninja and to a lesser extent the octagon each try to be something they're not and it compromises them. Revenge of the ninja simply gets on with delivering everything we could ask for from a movie like this, which makes it pure Sam Furstenberg. Even the grand's a ninja. By cutting the fat, taming the ninja myth-making and delivering some incredible set pieces, Furstenberg laid down the formula Hollywood would follow for the rest of the decade and gave us the most important bit of ninja lore. Only a ninja can stop a ninja. Only a ninja can defeat a ninja. Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. Only a ninja can defeat another ninja, see? Have you heard that line before somewhere? I think I have. But of course, not all US ninja movies follow the common formula, and ironically, the one that does it least was Furstenberg's next. Though it does follow some of the lore. Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. Ninja 3 The Dominations about a demonic shinobi who possesses an aerobics instructing telephone engineer in order to avenge himself on the cops who killed him. And as much as I'd like that to be a common formula, it still hasn't caught on. Sure beats the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Kasugi plays the good ninja flown in from Japan to exorcise and then stab in the head the evil ninja's spirit, and he hated it. Having been promoted to leading man in the last film, he wasn't happy to be forced back into a supporting role and felt canon were crazy to think a woman, in this case dancer Lucinda Dickey, could be believable as a ninja. I don't know why, she's no less convincing than Franco Nero. He is a ninja! He is not a ninja! In addition to the aerobics, the dancing, the demonic possession, and the ninjas, there's romance, of course. But before we get to the movie's most memorable moment, bear in mind it takes place just hours after horny cop Billy Seacourt saw all his colleagues murdered in a supernatural frenzy. Oh, God. In the space of four years, the canon ninja trilogy had evolved from a confused but promising idea through archetypal excellence to unhinged magnificence. You're full of surprises, aren't you? And the ninja itself had gone on a similarly epic journey through American pop culture. From near irrelevance in the late 70s, they were suddenly everywhere in the early 80s. When G.I. Joe was reconfigured in 1982, the ninja Snake Eyes was added to the lineup. And a couple of years later, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles comic book was launched. I imagine they'll be back later. But ninjas reached their biggest Western audience so far, cameoing on TV, especially in blockbuster miniseries Shogun. There were also attempts to launch them in a series of their own. Backdoor pilot Chips Force 7 might have been the strangest, with its team of police ninjas fighting crime with the aid of a racist puppet. I am third member of Distinguished Martial Arts Team. Well, tell him your name, dummy. I am known as Ying of Yang, thank you. Stranger still, they got John Reese davies for the villain. Sala really does play a ninja master, and it's just as amazing as you might imagine. Once more again! Take your shot! It has been said that man with chi is truly divine. Unfortunately, it didn't go anywhere, and nor did the pilot for The Last Ninja with Michael Beck. The master did a little better thanks to Sho Kasugi, but fails to convince us Lee Van Cleef was any more viable a ninja than John Reese davies There's no glory in the old days. We could do a couple hours on that one. But we will not, because in the moment, you will be dead. Yeah! So between 1980 and 1984, the Ninja movie, its profile and its audience evolved immeasurably in Europe and North America. But in Hong Kong and Japan, nothing had really changed. Yet. Find me a ninja who believes in the old ways, Mr. Parker. 
To begin with, Hong Kong reacted to this incipient ninja boom by rebadging kung fu movies, which is why so many alleged ninja movies from this era don't feature any ninjas. In Hong Kong, and by extension Taiwan and South Korea, actual movie ninjas were still largely limited to acting as an invading force or a villain's disposable private army. They were ninja, you know, but we beat them. Yes, we did. Yes. Anti-Japanese sentiment ran high in China, and during the 70s kung fu boom, the various film industries feeding the enormous market there had typecast ninjas as pantomime villains. They wouldn't get regular hero gigs in Hong Kong movies until Richard Harrison started playing them. Although a hint of that glorious future can be found in movies like Dragon Force, which features an early performance from an understandably confused Bruce Barron. First you send some girl at me with a flute. After that, then some kabuki samurai jumps down on top of me. And then some goddamn lions jump out from behind the bushes. What the hell is happening to me here? But in the early 80s, the most interesting ninja movies came from Taiwan. In 1983, Lee Cho Nam released Challenge of the Lady Ninja and followed it up a month later with A Life of Ninja. If you want my advice, if you should meet a ninja, run away as fast as you can. <laughs> Great as Lee's films are, they're hobbled in Taiwanese terms because they don't feature the most overlooked and underrated martial hero of the day, the extraordinary Alexander Lau. <laughs> The younger brother of actor Tong Lung, Lau was a Taiwanese Taekwondo champion who transitioned to movies under the guidance of filmmaker Robert Tai. And although he didn't really play ninjas, he did specialize in killing them. There really is a theme here. Those masked men are no ordinary killers. They're all Japanese ninja. Ninja? I'm not scared of them, they're punks. The best known of his ninja movies is Ninja Final Duel, but the first was the fabulous Ninja Kids. At least I think it was the first. The responsible ninjologist should take nothing at face value in this part of the world. I might have more confidence in the reported date if the movie was really directed by someone called Ko Pao, which it wasn't. Or if it featured any kids, which it doesn't. I'll take a demon ninja instead. As far as I can tell, Ninja Kids is about Lao's heroic pimp Shao Ku, a mystical chosen one who spends the movie being trained by a series of increasingly unpredictable shifu. There are at least two further plots, all lurching about interrupting one another, but I've no idea what they're about. Teacher, who are they? The three of the four elders of the temple. Deathman, the hunchback, and the cripple. The problem, as a proper critic might describe it, is that Ninja Kids is a feature-length edit of Joseph Kuo's Ninja Death trilogy, and the director took the opportunity to remove most of the exposition. All that remains a baffling fragment squeezed into the bits without fighting, and usually delivered soap opera style for maximum impact. Is she really my mother? Hmm. Xiao Ku. I may be blind, but I can still hear. She's indeed your mother. The Princess Mariko of Kyoto. Really? I honestly thought that character was dead. So do we know who his father is? Listen, the demon ninja is your true father! Well, of course, the father's the demon ninja who's controlled by the magical flute wielded by the lunatic dressed in gold foil. And isn't the demon ninja also Shao Ku's teacher's brother? Brother, it's me, Pai Shu! So that would make Shao Ku his teacher's nephew. But they never mention it. We should just be grateful there's no doubt who Shao Ku's teacher is. Teacher! 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 Don't call me teacher. Lao's movies have more to give, especially once they start to include Eugene Thomas. I'm trying to maintain some kind of order here, so we'll get to the likes of his spectacular super ninja in due course. First, we need to mop up the last of the intriguing damp patches from this pre-cut and paste flood. Movies from those innocent early years in which the Philippines could still lay claim to making the craziest ninja movies. Ninja. Pinoy super dwarf Weng Weng is best known for playing secret agent Double O in a pair of hugely enjoyable Bond parodies that form the heart of his tragically limited filmography. You're a great person, you know. You know what to say. Don't decide the way you use it. Maybe. But are you a sexual animal? I don't know. If you happen to pick up Andrew Leivold's documentary on him, you might have found an extra disc containing a movie called The Wild Wild Weng, a deranged kung fu western featuring tribal dwarves, Mexican banditos, and a detachment of ninjas for Weng to murder. Ah! 
Given all the words I just used, it's surprising the most unusual thing about the movie is comedy relief sidekick Lupo, because Lupo can't talk. It's all too what Lupo said. There are obviously a number of conceptual problems associated with a character who can't talk. Certainly giving him most of the exposition was a mistake. The bigger issue is the potential for irritation, but on balance it's seldom more annoying than it is fascinating. So I'm on board all the way, especially when things start to get weird. I said stop it, Lupo! Naturally, Weng's magnetic and spends the movie up to his usual antics, employing his diminutive stature in ever more inventive ways before sliding across the floor and kicking a bad guy in the balls. But this time he gets to serenade a young lady too, and it's magical. You're the only one I love. You're the only dream I love. Oh, please listen to my heart. Oh, please, my love. Good evening. Weng wasn't the only channel icon recruited to kill ninjas in the 1980s because in Turkey, Chanit Arkin found the job fell to him. In Death Warrior, Arkin plays wildcard cop Death Warrior, who seems to spend most of his time just hanging out being unbearably cool. Meanwhile, presumably nearby, a ninja master trains his students by throwing matches at trees and blowing up rocks in a field. This seems to be fine with Death Warrior until they shoot down the plane he's travelling on, apparently with Auric Goldfinger. So he puts everything on hold to motorcycle his way about a bunch of fields until he finds himself in the same one as the ninjas, which is bad news for them. Needless to say, Death Warrior was directed by Chetin and Anch, who stole this nighttime chase scene from Diamonds Are Forever and enhanced it with his own brightly lit footage of toy cars. If you watch carefully, or at all, you'll see this motorcycle is played by three different movies in three consecutive shots. At least that method didn't endanger anyone. Arkin wasn't happy to be repeatedly attacked by this inferno hanging from a stick. Some versions of Death Warrior feature additional scenes from Holy Sword, a ninja movie made a couple of years earlier. This fight's one for the ages, and not just because Arkin keeps it up for over five minutes. He'd actually play a ninja a few years later in the less interesting Son Karamanla, and depending on your perspective, would battle them again in Ninja Killer, a Hong Kong cut and paste movie based on Kung Fu on the Bosphorus, in which Arkin split his trousers doing this kind of thing. The Ninja Killer version is actually a lot of fun, benefiting as it does from an English dub and added Bolo Young. What do you want? I'm looking for Liu Kun. You want him? Consult my fist first. Elsewhere in Europe, Swedish filmmaker Mats Helga offered up cult favourite The Ninja Mission, a Cold War spy movie about the fight over a defecting scientist that's distressingly light on ninjas despite promising instructions like this. You're to take the ninja into Russia 
and get Markov out. The first phase of the ninja boom came to a close in 1984, and it was a busy year. There'd been delightful sproutings in Europe, Alex Lau had stunned in Taiwan, and in the US, Canon had made up for break-in with Ninja 3 The Domination. All in all, I think fans and filmmakers alike felt there'd been about the right amount of silliness and that things were looking good for the future. What they had no way of knowing was that future was about to be hijacked by the most exploitative filmmaking technique ever devised. In a small office in the Gali building on Hong Kong's Kowloon Peninsula, journeyman filmmaker Godfrey Ho was about to breathe life into the Ninja Franken movie. of the whole ninja empire is in your hands. What are you talking about? How did it beat the sort of catastrophe? What? Where are the drugs? Damn it! Are you ninjas? Cloak and dagger carpetbagger Joseph Lai has said the cut and paste Franken movie as we know it is the conception of he and then business partner Thomas Tang. I've been trained in time warp kung fu and my sole aim is to get rich. Around 1984, they split, Tang leaving to make rival movies at his own Filmark International. All this was happening just as the VHS gravy train was picking up steam, and both Shogun Assassin and Enter the Ninja proved to be hugely popular on home video. I've thought of something. Why don't we rent a video tonight? He cut off the heads of 131 lords. That led Lai in particular to deduce that what Western audiences wanted was ninjas, blood, and a white man with a mustache. Stop twisting the truth! He further reasoned that if he filmed these things, they could be added to random Taiwanese thrillers, because as Menachem Golan had already realized, the masks meant stuntmen could replace actors in the action scenes. House director Godfrey Ho was tasked with making it happen, and initially recruited American character actor Richard Harrison to be the white man with a mustache, on the grounds he was one and he needed the money. The resulting movie, or movies, proved the concept and set the formula for dozens more. Remember, born a ninja, die a ninja. Having said all that, it's important to understand that once you step into this realm, nothing is as it seems. Reason and logic are no defense against these movies, and they will bite you. Well, that's what you get for messing with me. The unmanageable tangle of misinformation wrapped around this corner of genredom is like no other. On online databases, a lot of the release dates seem to have been picked at random, and there's a casual approach to crediting the directors, many of the on-screen names being pseudonyms. They're not Chinese monks. They're ninja! In 1984, IFD only released one Guaylo ninja movie. The rest came later, but many are credited earlier. And because Ho was known to be behind some that were credited to other people, a myth has developed that he was responsible for them all. But several purported pseudonyms have since proved to be real people, or at least real people's pseudonyms. Though as we'll see, I'm not sure it's that simple, because there was a lot going on behind the scenes. I'll warn you, whoever you are, you're not allowed to meddle in the dealing of the Asian Star Wars strategy map. See to it, and don't push me, otherwise I'll use ninjutsu to deal with you. There are other factors contributing to this mess. Lai staffed his crew with triads, and they may not have been keen on using their real names or keeping real records. Either way, those records were all lost in 1996 in an entirely unsuspicious fire that destroyed the offices of both IFD and Filmark, and claimed the life of Thomas Tang. It's no wonder rumors of elaborate tax evasion and or insurance fraud persist. While conspiracy theories claim Tang faked his own death, never existed in the first place, or was even murdered by former partner Joseph Lai in a power struggle. You old fool. I built an entire ninja empire behind your back. I will be invincible when I get rid of you. Ultimately, the only thing we can be sure of is that the Ninja Franken movie is among the most audacious examples of charlatanism ever conceived. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire six shots or five shots only? To tell you the truth after all this excitement, I lost count myself. If you want your head blown off, just try it. 
If you want to make your own, it's pretty easy. First, find a foreign thriller featuring action, sex, and frequent telephone conversations. Where and when? As new as possible and preferably Taiwanese, although South Korean, Filipino, and Thai are incrementally more affordable. Of course, the ideal, no matter where it's from, is a movie with indigenous ninjas, but these were rare. Nin who? Ninja, Captain. Ninja. Next, Shanghai a couple of passing white guys and film them talking about ninjas. Ninja schemes, ninja clans, ninja statues, anything ninja's fine. But make sure they do some of it on the telephone. You've broken the ninja commandments by using the ninja challenge card for your personal gain. Then hire a Hong Kong stunt team and film it fighting in your local park. It doesn't have to be the park, but other locations might require permits or travel and who can be bothered? I stay here. Because I'm a ninja warrior. Finally, replace all the slow bits in the original movie with your exciting new ninja footage and dub the whole thing into English. This is where the telephones come in because they're essential for allowing the movies to talk to each other. I want you to go to Thailand and check out a man named Cuba. He may be involved in some political assassinations. I'm busy. Besides, I don't know where Thailand is. IFD's creativity and audacity in this area can be incredible. Ninja Knight Thunderfox follows an investigation by the Brad and Bonnie Detective Agency. But while Bonnie's part of the original movie, Brad's part of the additional footage, so the partners never meet, although that's the least of this thing's problems. Good morning, Bonnie and Brad Detective Agency. Good morning, Brad. Hi, Bonnie. Don't work too hard. <laughs> Take care. Listen, Brad, we've got a lot of things to... Hold on. I know what you're going to say. Essentially, if it weren't for the telephones, these movies would be stuck trying to make characters interact like this. There will be fighting and bloodshed. That's why I need you, Willie, to be my partner. Oh, consider it. Then we'll share it 50-50. If I encounter another group on the way, I'll kill them so there won't be any competition. Come to think of it, it would have been great if there weren't any telephones. Scenes in which the movies talk to each other face to face can be fascinating for all kinds of reasons. In Ninja Destroyer, you just want to know how the filmmakers could have been so lazy. I'm afraid he might even be a CIA agent. So he's one of them? While in Ninja Hunt, you'd be hard pushed to notice what was happening if you didn't know the context. Why are you crying? I didn't want to leave you, but I didn't have any choice. <laughs> Thank you for your pity. I just don't want to listen to your miserable patriotism anymore. Perhaps the best way anyone found to strike up one of these conversations was in Empire of the Spiritual Ninja, which has an original movie villain who talks to the good guys via a radio, making him easy to replace. Kim speaking. What is it? This is a warning. Don't interfere with the work of the spiritual ninjas, or it'll be the worst for you. Who is this? Are you threatening the police? I told you this was a warning, and this is what's going to happen to you if you ignore it. Huh? As a formula, this cutting and pasting was evolution, not revolution. But it was revolutionary in its relentlessness. Between 1985 and 1988, IFD alone produced around 50 ninja-themed Caucasian-starring Franken-movies, or Ninjamatics. Ho directing about half himself, starting with the first, Majestic Thunderbolt. Majestic Thunderbolt. A roaring tiger encounters a furious seagull. It's a big showdown. Never revealed on film before. The Thunderbolt trilogy stars Richard Harrison and was shot back to back during the actor's first trip to Hong Kong. Many of the key elements were in place from the start, including Harrison's CIA ninja persona and his habit of talking to the other movie over the phone. And I got reason to believe that the man behind the organization is Jackal Chan. God, he's a real bastard. But there isn't too much craziness and memorable moments are pretty much limited to tiny car versus roller skate ninjas. This first foray into full-blown ninjamatics proved popular, so Lai tried making a couple without Harrison, recruiting Pierre Tremblay from IFD's dubbing department, where he'd been adding English dialogue to Brazilian soap operas for Indonesian television. Really? Can you imagine what it's like trying to research a subject that doesn't make sense even when it isn't lying to you? I mean, what's this guy doing? I don't care if the Red Devils black ninjas or little green men from Mars. Unfortunately, Tremblay didn't have a mustache, so he was teamed with Bruce Barron, an actor who'd recently grown one in the hope of finding work as a ninja. But Lai also brought Harrison back to Hong Kong for a second visit, and a new batch of ninjamatics yielded the best known of them all. Listen to me. Trader, I believe that you've received a death message from our ninja empire. Ninja is supreme and you have double-crossed it. Why did you do that? The Ninja Empire is evil. I have to reform the Ninja Empire. 
That is why I took away the Golden Ninja Warrior. Garfield aside, Ninja Terminator is a superior ninja matic. It shows Ho's work in the field in the best light because the additional ninja footage is entertaining and reasonably well integrated into an inherently interesting original movie. Bring me the body of that Golden Ninja Warrior. And if the brother or sister offer any resistance, you must kill them without any hesitation. That original movie is Korean thriller The Uninvited Guest of the Star Ferry, and it features plenty of action and striking characters like Jaguar Wong, a detective who aids Ninja Master Harry in his battle against Watermelons, Ozzy Osbourne, and the Ninja Empire, which communicates via tiny robots. Traitor, listen. You have just three days to return the Golden Ninja Warrior to our master. Here and obey. Unfortunately, Harrison's second trip to Hong Kong ended badly. It's quite possible he didn't realise the ninja movie he shot on his first trip was actually three ninja movies, or that the one he just finished was in fact four. But the final batch can't have been anticipated by anyone because it has no precedent. According to Harrison, he only shot this batch because Joseph Lai had trapped him in a dodgy contract. But it's these final and most mercenary movies the actor believes overexposed him and ended his career. Once a ninja, always a ninja. These movies are easy to identify because Harrison's mustache free in them. Michael Dudikoff having finally liberated the upper lip for white ninjas everywhere. Shit. Shit. Damn it! At the start of 1987, IFD had released fewer than a dozen ninja matics, but production was about to go into overdrive. And despite having an angry Harrison as his indentured servant, Lai needed more white guys and demanded Godfrey Ho get creative to find them. You're forcing me to use ninja techniques. They will work. Chungking Mansions was a seedy food market and flop house just a few doors down from IFD's Nathan Road headquarters, and in the mid-80s it was home to an edgy blend of low-level triads and transient Europeans who were often on the run from authorities, gangsters or paternity suits. You're all a bunch of filthy scums! Ho would hang around the entrance checking out everyone who came and went, and when he spotted a Caucasian male who wasn't excessively drunk he'd offer them a job. It was an unusual casting process, but effective, and helped IFD build a repertory company of in-house ninjas. So, you're the Knights of Justice. Other than Harrison, the most prolific was Stuart Smith, an English-born, Aussie-raised aspiring actor who'd come to Hong Kong to make movies. He also became a prolific dubber, and unlike most IFD regulars, got away with appearing in film arc movies too, including the dreadful Ninja in Action. My master gave it to me, to get rid of the ninjutsu. To a ninja, loss of ninjutsu is even more painful than death. Oh, I see. Highlights of the later additions to IFD's roster include Pierre Kirby, a mysterious chancer who disappeared in 1990 and may have been murdered by pirates. I told you before, the dragon's fire burns hot. And my favorite, Cornish travel agent Mike Abbott, who was a bit late to the game and ended up in all the obscure trash. I was so close to becoming the ultimate ninja! The ultimate ninja? Abbott was working as a doorman in a Kowloon bar when his six-foot-tall bodybuilder's physique caught Ho's attention and led to him being cast in a string of late-era ninja-matics. Most notably the Ninja Knight or Official Exterminator series, in which he mainly sits in an office making threats. Let me take care of him, boss. You better. Otherwise, it's gonna be your ass. Most of these actors would have found it tough to conjure much believability at the best of times, but whether to further undermine their credibility or amuse audiences, IFD made them wear headbands emblazoned with the word ninja, and whenever possible dressed them in fluorescent romper suits. Our Silver Ninja Empire was destroyed by the Purple Ninjas many years ago. I am going to challenge them. These characters were also given the least ninja-like names imaginable. Harrison played Gordon the Ninja Master several times, but there are a variety of inappropriate monikers. This is Henry. So Lenny sold us out. I'll consult my partner Ronald. I think they are Hector's men. Wilbur the headquarters. If you see a foreigner named Byron around here, Alfred's got a job working at the whorehouse. Don't forget, Kevin. He's a ninja. <laughs> you know, Rudolph, your mother was right. You are a maniac. In order to put his new ensemble to work, Lai also needed new directors. And I've avoided getting bogged down in this miasma of interconnected aliases once already, so I'm not going to get into it now. The truth is grim. Let's just say if we go by the credits, then Joseph Lai directed actors he's never met. 
Whether Ho, Chu Li, or even Lai directed movies credited to Lai or anyone else doesn't really matter, because even the real directors weren't the real directors. What the hell are you talking about? Ninjamatics don't have a director in any conventional sense, but if they did, perhaps it should be the person who shot 80% of the footage, not the person who shot 20. Yeah! That's a second unit or action director. If anyone at IFD deserves credit for being the author of these things, in most cases it can only really be Ho. If only everybody thought like you do then we would have no worries at all. Based on first-hand testimony, even when Ho didn't shoot the additional footage, he usually oversaw it, and despite their wildly variable quality and style, he apparently had a hand in the writing, editing, and dubbing of virtually all IFD's ninja movies. Jesus Christ, I'm impressed. Glad to hear it. Let's move on. In a minute, because even allowing for all that, Ho's still credited, both officially and informally, with dozens of movies he had nothing to do with. Some made by IFD after he left, but most by Filmark, where he never went. Despite endless assertions to the contrary, there's no such thing as a Filmark ninja movie made by Godfrey Ho. Just a fairy tale. They don't exist. Now, there, you see? I told you they didn't exist. 1987 had been an incredible year for IFD. They'd released more than 20 movies, mostly ninjamatics, and looked set to do the same in 1988. But, operating in a near vacuum and amazed at the kind of ninja tat foreign distributors seemed to love, Lai had begun to cut costs and quality was slipping if you can believe that. It was most obvious in the additional fight scenes, which were becoming more reliant on guns, because it made them cheaper and easier to shoot, especially if it was done like this. But guns are the ninja movie's kryptonite, robbing us of both action and the ridiculous weapons that are such a big part of the appeal of these things. Not just the wild stuff like flying turbo nets, the hula hoops of doom, and the deadly symbols. <laughs> but also the bread and butter stuff like powder bombs, exploding shuriken and slingshots, all of which are used less in the later movies. The original movie had always been key to a Ninjamatic's overall appeal, but with less added footage they became even more important, and their quality was variable. I wasn't entirely surprised this fight from Power of Ninjutsu moved outside without a transition shot, but when it descended to the ground and found its way to a park, even I raised an eyebrow. <laughs> At the same time, Ninja Avenger is arguably saved by the Taiwanese Western on which it's based. The hero is pretty much a cross between Django and Jesus, and I'd like to have seen more of this kind of thing. But quality movies like that cost Lai somewhere in the region of $50,000 a piece, and in Thailand he could pick up simpler equivalents for 10, so that's what he increasingly did. At least they were still real movies though. IFD really jumped the shark when they began using television series instead. American Commando Ninja and Born a Ninja were derived from the same show and remain among the least popular ninjamatics. I forgive them, but only because they invent a martial art called Hocus Pocus. You fight more than Jiu-Jitsu, or Ninjutsu. It's Chinese Kung Fu, also uh, a kind of magic which has been passed down from generation to generation. Hocus Pocus. Hocus Pocus? Hocus Pocus. Uh, I don't get it. As 1988 wore on, there were more unwelcome evolutions, because for some inexplicable reason, Oliver Stone's Wall Street became the big new influence. In the idealistic early days of three years before, plots revolved around diamond smuggling or a magical ninja statue, usually this magical ninja statue. But in 1988, they were increasingly about formulas and data. I don't give a damn about this stuff ninjutsu. I just want one thing, and that's that formula. And not that stupid golden horn of Tanaka's. That meant the additional footage began to revolve more around white-collar ninjas in offices than psychedelic ninjas in parks. Whether the business was in drugs or in unexplained formulas, it was somehow traded on the stock exchange and involved a lot of board meetings. As you can see from this report, our company isn't doing very well. Why do you suppose that is? All this meant that traditional ninjas, by which of course I mean these, became less visible and active. It's easy to have them fighting over a statue they all believe is theirs, but they're less well suited to tackling stockbrokers. Those guys are really deadly. Even ninjas are no match for them. <coughs> no! 
1988 was the year IFD killed the Ninjamatic. They effectively flooded the market with crap and then left the building. Philmark following along after depositing instant rage on the doorstep as a farewell gift. In 1990, Lai would revisit something like the original formula for a series of three kids' movies, but these would be the very last of their kind. We have a priceless antique statue which has been stolen by the Black Ninja. Black Ninja? What do they look like? They're all black. Oh, sounds like Black Ninja to me. Cutting and pasting continued, though, with kickboxing the next action fad, although it never caught on to the same extent, and IFD's contributions weren't as much fun as they look. If you have a sister, we can open up a brothel. I know you. You just want to f*** all day, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, as far as I can make out, that's the story of Hong Kong's cut-and-paste Ninja Franken movies. Within a few years of their demise, Joseph Lai would effectively retire, Philmark's Thomas Tang would die in that terrible building fire, and Godfrey Ho would depart IFD to make a few real movies in America, including one that ranks among his best and might set a record for man-growling. <laughs> It was 1984 when we left the real world behind, and returning to Hollywood in 1985, we find the ninja phenomenon entering its second phase, which, like the first, would be dominated by a canon franchise. American ninja, I presume. How very nice to meet you. An American ninja? What are you talking about? There is no such thing. There'd been several by 1985, notably Leo Fong, Chuck Norris, if he really was a ninja in the octagon, Franco Nero, if he really was an American in Enter the Ninja, on television Lee Van Cleef, and in Hong Kong Richard Harrison and the often overlooked Bruce Barron. But most of these actors only got the job because of the moustache, and none had come close to engaging with both a worldwide audience and the core fan base. Go to hell! Who do you think you are? You big s***! That's where American Ninja was meant to come in. Menachem Golan had come up with the title in 1983, but it was kicked around for a while before it got off the ground. Initially, Missing in Action's writer James Bruner was charged with working up a screenplay. Golan loved it and wanted to make it, but it didn't really involve any ninjas, so it ended up being filmed as Invasion USA instead. They wanted a war. See you in hell. He gave them one. Send me a postcard. Chuck Norris. Invasion USA. This is the origin of the legend that has Chuck Norris set to star in American Ninja, only to pull out when he decided he didn't want to wear a mask. Essentially, he was attached to the title, but not to the movie it ended up being applied to. Incidentally, he's wearing the evil ninja outfit from Ninja 3 The Domination in this promo. A new screenplay came to Ninja 2 and 3's Sam Furstenberg, who set about finding a star, and this is where something revolutionary occurred to him. Maybe a white ninja doesn't need to have a mustache. Are you kidding? Furstenberg found Michael Dudikoff in auditions, and all at Canon agreed he was a great prospect, possessed of James Dean's cool, Errol Flynn's athleticism, and Marilyn Monroe's completely bald upper lip. He had an old-school charm, and while he didn't do martial arts, that hadn't bothered anyone before. And if Canon were smart, they knew it didn't matter anyway, because Steve James. <laughs> Dudikoff's Private Joe Armstrong is a civilian screw-up and secret ninja conscripted into the military and sent to the Philippines, where he befriends James's Corporal Curtis Jackson, who might be the best non-ninja character in any of these movies. Very good. I've touched the ninja. Tadashi Yamashita, who played the villain in The Octagon and turned down the villain in Enter the Ninja, here plays the villain, the Black Star Ninja who's part of a backstory too absurd to explain and a plot that's too sensible to be funny. Needless to say, the movie was a hit, raking in $15 million in the US alone, making a sequel inevitable. A sequel that very much drops all that sensible plot stuff. I mean, what is this? Ninjas? Drug pushers? My men being kidnapped and murdered? This is really beginning to get on my tits. Controversially, American Ninja 2 The Confrontation was shot in South Africa, where the country's policy of apartheid had led to widespread boycotting by Hollywood. In response, the government had conceived a lucrative scheme of tax incentives to law back filmmakers, and it was that that attracted Golan. Very great man, you know, a very, very smart man. 
but God bless Menachem, he wasn't one to give out a lot of money. To explain the change in climate, Armstrong and Jackson are sent to the Caribbean to investigate the disappearance of a number of Marines. The plot this time revolving around a drug lord who's using science to create a genetically and mechanically engineered private army of super ninjas. So there you are. The super ninja. The ultimate fighting machine. Dudikoff's Armstrong is a less brooding and more likable presence. Mike Stone, the original author and original star of Enter the Ninja, is great as evil ninja Tojo Ken. And there's superb scenery chewing from Jeff Kelantano. Escort these three men outside. And if a word of this gets out, I'll have you shot, you understand? Sir! Besides Cannon, the other major ninja force in Hollywood at the time was Sho Kasugi, who'd parted ways with Golan and company after the ignominy of Ninja 3, and moved to Transworld Entertainment, where he made Pray for Death and Rage of Honor, both of which are among the best US ninja movies of the 80s. <laughs> Rage of Honor sees him branching out as a suave cop avenging his partner's murder, while in the more traditional Pray for Death he's a family man who's moved to the US in an attempt to leave his ninja past behind. Naturally, he's instead forced to re-embrace it in the face of a crime wave and becomes a vigilante superhero. Think Death Wish meets Batman. Mr. Sato, you're from Japan. Do ninjas still exist? Ninjas? No, of course not. Dad, you must be watching too many ninja movies. That's what I thought. These movies were part of an incredible run that also included Nine Deaths of the Ninja, a Bondian camp fest in the vein of Megaforce, only with more preposterous villains. <laughs> Bravo! How entertaining! I've never seen such a pitiful group of hostages before! Most amusing! Kasuki plays an anti-terrorist agent responsible for rescuing hostages and it's the only time he dropped that aura of intensity and had some fun with the part. Sadly his voice was replaced without his knowledge and although the dub makes it funnier it sometimes feels really wrong. I want a clean girl. No clap. Kasugi's post-canon offerings were part of a lively scene in Hollywood, where production of independent ninja movies was at its peak between 1985 and 1988. Most were unremarkable adaptations of existing formula. But the best worst, including Sakura Killers and Unmasking the Idol, owed as much to Hong Kong's ninjamatics. Calling all guards, calling all guards, be on the lookout for trespassing ninjas. In Unmasking the Idol, Playboy super spy Duncan Jacks is a master ninja sent on a mission to defeat a clan of evil ninjas with the help of his pet baboon. Who's also a ninja. I talked about it in my Bond exploitation video along with sequel Order of the Black Eagle, but I hadn't noticed at the time how much it's like a more extravagant Godfrey Ho movie. We're waiting for a man that many people consider the most dangerous ninja on the face of the earth. Aside from myself, of course. <laughs> Secure Killers looks even more like IFD's work because it's effectively a ninjamatic, the product of at least three separate shoots that may or may not have been coordinated in some way. Director Dusty Nelson doesn't know because the producers didn't inform him. They just gave him the footage and told him to turn it into a movie, but that footage didn't make it easy. But you must watch the progress in each of our sub subsidiaries. Tell Brock to contact the New York and Tokyo headquarters. Have him ask Tokyo to send the sci-fi experts and research scientists as soon as possible. Amid the fog of unknowns, the only real certainty is that Chuck Connors plays the Colonel, a government agent running a mission in Taiwan from his ranch in the US, where we occasionally cut back to him playing golf and killing ninjas. It's like watching a Pink Panther movie. Every time Cluzo relaxes, you just know Kato's going to leap out of a cupboard and attack him. Like Hong Kong's Ninjamatics, most American movies featured both good and evil ninjas, but there were some that wanted us to see them as purely villainous, and one in particular made its position clear.
Miami Connection was the brainchild of South Korean Taekwondo Grandmaster YK Kim, an instructor and motivational speaker who sank his life savings into one of the most extraordinarily misguided film projects ever conceived. I chose to get the job from Asian. Don't bother us. Like the last two movies, it features some of the best worst of both American and Asian influences. On the surface, it looks like a cheap American genre movie with lots of fannying about and a plot involving coke dealing motorcycle ninjas. Just remember what I said if you don't want to get hurt. You don't scare me at all. Jane, I want to talk at to you all. later. Goodbye. But underneath, it's a traditional Korean, Taiwanese or Hong Kong Kung Fu monk versus evil ninja movie. Instead of trying to kick our heroes out of the Shaolin temple, it's a whole rock club. And instead of wanting to teach ninjutsu there, they want to sell coke. He's in there every night, this damn gang selling that stupid cocaine. That would be fine, but of course the problem is it's rubbish. I took this film, Hollywood, to over 100 distribution companies. Every single one say, what? It is trash, throw away. It's also all but a remake of Park Woo Sang's LA Street Fighters, which has a similar plot and characters, including a 40-year-old teenage student played by the guy who financed everything. Oh, you okay, my Mom? baby. Hold on, kid, wait, Your that's face. that. You meant fighting again. Mom, who is this guy? Never mind, honey. He's Charlie, my new friend. You understand. Mom, Hi, kid. Go away. <laughs> Come on, baby. Let's go upstairs. All this talk of heroic monks and evil shinobi make it a good time to check back in on Alexander Lau and see whether Taiwan's favorite ninja slayer is still one of the best kept secrets of the 80s. <laughs> When we last saw Lau, he was looking for his teacher, teacher, but about to find Eugene Thomas Trammell, a Chicago-born athlete who was swept up in the kung fu craze of the 70s and moved to Taiwan to learn more. Once there, he got into movies and formed a loose double act alongside Lau that began with 1984's Incredible Super Ninja. <laughs> Like a lot of Lau's work, the Super Ninja was either financed or bought by Filmark, which is probably why it feels like three different movies. Initially, it's a cop thriller with a hint of black exploitation. That goddamn Nazi playing the white man game with me. Just stop it! Don't let it bother you. Then Lau's character is falsely accused of murder, and it becomes first blood for a bit. But before long, everyone goes to Hong Kong, and suddenly it's a regular kung fu movie. Master, have you heard of the Five Element Ninjas? Ninjas. Whichever one it's being, it's always excellent. The fight scenes are often sped up, which is a problem with other Kuo Ren Wu movies, but as ever with Lao, they're relentless and explosive, while the dubbing's ridiculous and the music's stolen. That's the murderer! <laughs> I don't want you. If you hand over the girl, I won't harm you. I'll kill him, teacher! 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 Ninja USA was made by the same team around the same time and offers more of the same high-quality frolics, only with Tremel in a villainous role this time. You're the undisputed king of the drug scene in the States. <laughs> <laughs> the money we make from selling drugs, we can buy ourselves weapons and then build a big empire. I admire your plans. Mafia vs. Ninja and Ninja Condors came later, and to be honest, all these movies are so similar and so simple, there's very little to say about them once you've established how great the fight scenes and stars are. There is one Lao movie that stands out a little from the pack, though, even if it's only because of the spider riding water ninjas. The Water Spider Assault Unit. Equally lethal, both under and above water. Ninja Final Duel is a classic Robert Tai heroic Shaolin monks versus evil ninja invaders movie and it hits all the usual beats, including the always emotionally demanding scene of Lau receiving his motivation. There's a girl's head, wrapped in a bundle, left on the front doorstep. It looks like the girl you used to hang out with. Variations of this movie exist in more forms than can be counted, but the only one that needs to explain itself has Rudy Ray Moore spliced into it. Well, Ling King Tong had to sing his song, Stick with the original. You must be jive. Don't blame me. 
I was just passing by, and I found her dead. Do you expect me to believe that? That it's just a coincidence? I'm a holy man. I don't kill. A black monk traveling in China? Shaolin get a freak. <laughs> As 1989 rolled round, the ninja craze looked like it had had enough. In Taiwan, Lau would soon quit acting to focus on choreography. In Hong Kong, the ninja-matic was all but dead, and in the US, the flagship American ninja series was trapped in a downward spiral. Made by the hand of Allah to bring the great Satan to his knees. Cannon's perpetual financial woes had finally led to the company's collapse, and a buyout saw Menachem Golan ousted by the new owners. You might have thought the ideas would become more sensible, but American Ninja 3 is about a mad scientist who organizes a martial arts tournament to demonstrate his genetically engineered super ninjas. Ninja. Not again. Michael Dudikoff didn't want to return to South Africa and was replaced by David Bradley, who's fine, but why they didn't promote Steve James is a mystery. Perhaps as a result of that slight, part four had to make do without him, which means Bradley got a new partner. He's the best trained operator we have. He's also a fantastic bowler, but this is not a game, Gavin. Those were ninja. American Ninja 5 makes even less sense, mainly because it was originally a movie called American Dragons, but was retitled to capitalize on the blockbuster irrelevance of the last movie. So, like the Ninjamatic, we reboot for kids, meaning even the American Ninja ended up as PG-13 family fodder. Wait, T Tetsu, where are you going? Athens. Athens? Athens. Oh, Tetsu. Sayonara, fellas. Oh, how'd he do that? It's a ninja secret. There were more children's ninja movies and parody ninja movies than the real thing during the 90s. Although there is a long history of adolescents make-believing as hired killers, usually in really weird movies. <laughs> Naturally, Taiwan had a go with movies like the almost indescribable Seven Lucky Ninja Kids, which actually only has one ninja kid, but that's fine because there's everyone else, including Zatoichi Kid. My favourites are toss up between Bruce Lee Kid and Rambo Kid. Okay, you guys, I'm your company commander, and you can call me Rocky, even though in the States they call me Rambo. Okay? Ah! This kind of movie was particularly big in the Philippines, where Ninja Kids, not to be confused with Alexander Lau's Ninja Kids, Ninja. is a domestic classic. I can see why, because it has a lovely Californian Goonies vibe, and it's less harrowing than me and Ninja Lit. Presumably coincidentally, this Pinoy Curio is like a blueprint for half of Hollywood's horrible 1990s mini ninja movies. In fact, the plot's identical to that of Surf Ninjas, something I don't appreciate knowing. Of course, the catalyst for all that oversaturated rubbish was less Watari Ninja Boy and more... The Turtles were conceived as a superhero parody with vague notions of Teen Titans, X-Men and Daredevil, and exploded into the mainstream in 1987 when creators Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird sold off various commercial rights. By the time the movie was released in 1990, they were one of the biggest pop culture properties on the planet. God, I love being a turtle! The combination of cartoon hijinks and death wish grime make this a unique movie even before you consider the premise behind it. This version of New York's pretty dark, with crime rates out of control, latchkey kids drawn into violent gangs, and even heroes like Casey Jones guilty of rampant homophobia. Now, what is all this talk about spending the night down here? Mm, you're a claustrophobic. <laughs> you want a fist in the mouth? Mm -mm. I've never even looked at another guy before. It was just the right vibe and the movie became the most financially successful independent released up to that point, which, as ever, made sequels inevitable, but they were also inexcusable. Absolutely! Swing! <laughs> Leaning more towards the cartoon after parents' groups criticised the first movie's violence, Secret of the Ooze and Three essentially fell into line with the rest of the North American ninja movie scene, having been made entirely for children and idiots.
Not everyone in Hollywood seemed to realize that ninjas had been co-opted by kids, though, so the 90s were dotted with random old-school ninja movies. I'm for hire. Most were buddy cop-type deals, Lethal Weapon, but also Black Rain's shadow looming large over the likes of Red Sun Rising. I think this is meant to be Jean-Claude Van Damme and the far superior Immortal Combat, which pairs Sonny Chiba's retired ninja with Roddy Piper's himself. And if that isn't strange enough, there's Extra Large Ninja Shadow. Left turtle. A US shot Italian TV movie that teams Bud Spencer with Michael Winslow. And you'll save me from all that, huh? Get yeah, back your big beans. You then touch my big beans. Yes, Tomato. Don't touch his beans. <laughs> In the US, ninjas have kept up appearances ever since, often playing the weird bridesmaid in major action movies, occasionally the weird bride in excellent B-movies. And we were recently treated to a blast from the past when Vinegar Syndrome unearthed New York Ninja, a vigilante epic made in the early 80s by one-time phony shinobi and now vengeful ninja John Liu. This city owes me. Well, what's that? Justice. Left uncompleted at the time, it was pieced together and released in 2021 with a dub performed by period-appropriate stars like Don the Dragon Wilson, Cynthia Rothrock and Leon Isaac Kennedy. The ninja. It's gotta be. New York Ninja seems like being the last gasp of the 1980s ninja boom, unless someone uncovers a forgotten Leo Fong classic. Bushido! No. No! No! Ninja! Exactly. At the start of all this, I wondered if there's anything we might learn from ninjas. They always seem to have things figured out, so there must be something. Helpfully, they're always banging on about their code which as far as I can tell has five core tenets, and the time's finally come to see what they are. Only a ninja can destroy a ninja. Yep, everyone knows that one. No one can stop ninja. Well, that just contradicts the first one. No ninja can refuse another ninja's challenge. That's really more of a plot device. A ninja warrior can never get involved. What does that even mean? Once a ninja, always a ninja. These are f***ing useless. <laughs> Thank you.